Reporter, Lou Gardner. I tell you, I don't care what they call me. They can call me a Marxist, a Jesuit, a flat earther, a Trotskyite, a vegetarian. I don't care what I'm called. Because I know why they call us names. It's because they dare not face our arguments. That is why the name calling goes on. It was in April that Tony Benn dropped his bombshell. He would oppose Dennis Healy for the deputy leadership of the Labour Party. This week, a meeting of the Labour Party executive. And once again, Tony Benn walks his own path and dominates the proceedings. Michael Foote must feel that it is difficult to escape Benn's shadow. Few now doubt that the future of the party is at stake. Tony Benn ignored pleas to stay his ambition for a year or more. For Dennis Healy, elected like foot by Labour MPs, it is a stab in the back. The plain fact is that if this minority has its way, we shall be too busy fighting one another to spare time for fighting Mrs Thatcher. Sleepy Tory Bournemouth, an unlikely venue for an airing of socialist squabbles. But it is in the nation's seaside resorts that the battle for Labour's soul takes flight this summer. Copy of the militant. Labour's Marxist voice. Rank the new leadership election system gives 40% of the vote to the unions. So as delegates and their militant courtiers gather for the annual round of union conferences, they are wooed by the protagonists. Tony Ben meeting. People ask questions. But before Ben addressed a fringe meeting at Newpee, the union's group of sponsored MPs were invited to come clean about their voting intentions. Well, I'm uh, uh, Ronald Moyle, East Lewisham. I shall be voting for uh, Dennis Healy because I think he is the one who is most likely to contribute towards our winning the next general election. I believe we've got a winning combination with Foot and Healy, and I intend to back Healy. Uh, yeah. Reg Rice, Wood Green. I shall vote for Tony Benn. <laughs> And I shall support him in his campaign actively throughout the country because I believe that Dennis Healy really screwed the members of this union. Yeah. Tony Benn. Benn's fringe meeting was packed out. Most of his meetings are. There are times when he sounds like a schoolmaster. But the lecturing tone belies the radicalism. The policies he sets out would change the face not only of the Labour Party, but of Britain. A return to full employment by the use directly of the North Sea oil revenues, by the use of money now wasted on defence. And we want access to the nation's savings, which the City of London now put into speculation and abroad, we want to put that into our industry to get our industry going again. And where money goes in on public account, there must be public <laughs> accountability and public ownership. The so second point is this question of where the growth is to come. And the greatest area of growth and employment is in the public services. That's where the work is needed. That's where the jobs will come from. And just as rearmament financed itself, because instead of getting the dole, armament workers had a job and paid their taxes and that financed the welfare state so the public services will finance the uh, development of our full employment policy. If Tony tries harder, rarely a day goes by without a Ben speech somewhere in the land. He distrusts the media and believes in taking the message to the people. We want absolute equality for women in fact as well as in law. We want the rights of the trade unions to be entrenched. We want the black communities to be absolutely full citizens in our society with no racism encouraged by unemployment. And we want to clean up once and for all the House of Lords which is against everything that we stand for. Next day, Ben did not have it all his own way. Conference debated a motion urging him to stand down in the interests of party unity. It took nerve to go to the rostrum with such a plea. I heard a lot of criticism of past Labour governments and of Dennis Healy last night. I would point out that Tony Benn was a cabinet minister in the last Labour governments and he went along with cabinet decisions. Indeed, I remember back when Barbara Castle tried to put through in place of strife. One of her lieutenants at that time happened to be a man called Tony Benn. What is Tony Benn up to now? Is this Paul on the road to Damascus? But the left were not for converting. 
they had seen their vision, and the apostle is Tony Benn. The vote for this resolution will be seen not just as a vote against Tony Benn's candidature, but as a vote, and it will be portrayed in the press, as a vote against the policies that Benn is standing for, policies that this union has supported. All right. All those in favour of the emergency resolution, please show. <laughs> OK. Those against. That's lost. Resounding defeat for the anti-Bennites. Now New People will poll its membership to decide who to support. It is likely the vote will go to Ben. Labour's turmoil occurs against a backcloth of the worst unemployment since the 30s. Up and down the country, union delegates have been invited to give their support, financial and moral, to the People's March for Jobs. But being anti-Tory is not enough, says Ben, who has found in the march a ready-made platform. He saw them off, he will greet them in London, and as they wound through the Midlands countryside, he was waiting for them in Wolverhampton. They are the foot sluggers of his army. As the marchers move from town to town, so Tony Benn moves from issue to issue, tossing his thoughts into the political arena like so many hand grenades. And each explosion is louder than the last. His call for British troops in Ulster to be replaced by a UN force infuriated the Labour leadership committed to a bipartisan policy. Brash, breezy Blackpool, where many a political battle has been fought in the past. The town has seen more conferences than it has had fish suppers. Into town this month came two unions. Both would provide an insight into how the great debate is being manipulated. Frank Chappell rules his electrical and plumbing union with a strong right hand. Tony Benn did not even bother to come near this conference. But Dennis Healy was guest of honour. Healy is assured of the union's vote. However, even the most carefully managed conference can have its surprises. Before Healy could speak, the left staged a demonstration. It was supposed to be against the chairman's ruling on a motion on picketing. Few doubted that it was aimed at the deputy leader. Just come on, just go, just go. Out of the rostrum. Just a minute. I know that uh, you, you are, I know, I know, I know that this is part and parcel of a performance because we've got the television cameras here. You just go back, brother. I, I would like to just get on with the business of conference and you can leave the rostrum before you come in. Out of the rostrum. I have now declared that motion lost, which it was overwhelmingly lost, and we are... I'm telling you this, that we are now on the next item. Just move, just Unsubtle in tactics, the left were castigated by Healy in aggressive form. We met it again and again on the doorstep during the local elections in the last few weeks. The reason is that we've been forced to spend too much of the last two years in constitutional wrangles of no interest to the mass of our supporters, in which the minority never accepted defeat, returning again and again to the battle, until confusion or exhaustion brought them victory. And now we face the prospect of continuous annual contests for the party leadership. These people continually accuse the last Labour government, of which some of them were unprotesting members, of betraying the electorate. They do their best to undermine confidence in the current party leadership and they seek to get rid of any Labour MP who doesn't pay homage to their sectarianism or who voted as they themselves voted on issues like the expulsion of two former agents of the CIA. And they use barefaced lies to support their campaign of vilification. The memory of the row lingered on. Next day, the platform decided things would be more peaceful without cameras present. But Frank Chappell did explain how he equated party unity with calling Ben a little Stalin. Well, I think the issue now is not the orthodox party, as you call them, laying down to what the incursions of the left and the revolutionaries have done, but to stand up and fight. And what we're trying to do is to save the Labour Party from uh, disintegration 
and uh, disappearance from the political scene. Right, the David Oil meeting tonight, 8 o'clock. But what of those who have strayed from Labour's flock? Their spokesman was in town. Tonight. I think the idea of a trade union bloc vote choosing a future prime minister is uh, a most uh, monstrous proposal. In many ways, what Tony Benn is saying is the policy of the party. Uh, in, in many respects, what he stands for is what the party is committed to. Uh, and I suppose it's uh, logical he should stand. Nevertheless, you do know how it works. Do you think he can get there? I've got a shrewd idea how it works. Yes. Well, whether he'll win? Well, he started off with everybody saying he hadn't got a prayer. Uh, now people are beginning to look at it twice. I don't know. I mean, I'm not in it. I should have thought probably Dennis Healy will squeak home with a few block votes. <coughs> but Dr Owen's cynicism had no place in Wolverhampton. Tony Benn was mingling with his followers with the air of a man who knows that his faith is the rock of ages. Uh, some people might find it rather odd if the Labour movement is praying to help the unemployment problem. Oh, socialism came out of the Bible, didn't it? I mean, it was the Christian message that all men and women were brothers and sisters. We're going round this way, are we? Right. Mr. Benn. <laughs> Bless you. How do you do? How do you get to be the boss? Hi, Tony. Hello. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Here he dropped the lecturing style, Ben's guide to the future, and chose an almost evangelical approach. Comrades, uh, I think for all of us here today, this is a very moving occasion. I was with you, as you know, the marchers know, in Liverpool, and I must warn them that I'm going to be there again in Watford and in Brent and in London. And uh, it is a march for human dignity and against those forces which still try to persuade us that men and women should be crucified on a cross of gold in the name of monetarism and profit and loss. And we will not accept that. The Midlands are behind you, we shall not be moved. The spinners give new life to an old protest song. Tony Benn seems to draw emotional manner from such rallies, or so it appeared. Surely that could not have been a moat in his eye. Do you enjoy things like this? Well, they're very inspiring. I mean, it, to see those old people dancing and young people dancing, what we're seeing is the rebirth of hope. It's not a question of enjoying, it's inspiring. Can I ask you how you think the deputy leadership battle is going? I, 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 honestly, brother, it's not about that. And you corrupt this if you make it about that. What we're talking about today is the rebirth of hope of people. If this country wants to change, no power on earth will stop it. And until it wants to change, whoever's leader can't do much about it. So it's absolutely irrelevant. What we've got to give people in Britain is hope. And it can't be done from the top, it can only be done in Wolverhampton, by marchers, by people. Yeah, That's yeah, where it all begins, you know. Can I put to you what yeah. uh, Frank Chappell said about no, you? No, you can't. No, you can't. He no, called you, you a little no, Stalin. No, no, no. Yet for a man who eschews the cult of the individual, there is little doubt that Tony Benn knows exactly how to use best his own personality and to turn each situation to advantage and when to stoke the argument. Last week, he dropped the biggest bombshell of the lot by marching into the Westminster lobby in defiance of Michael Foote's strategy about how the defence debate should be conducted. The leadership was furious. The Imperial Hotel Blackpool before the opening session of the Staffs Association Conference and Clive Jenkins relaxes. He is confident of keeping Dennis Healy's chances afloat. The union leadership has decided to head off the Benites by urging conference to refer the leadership issue back to the branches. But as Clive floats peacefully, other forces are gathering. The left's ubiquitous policy slinger 
hits town in plenty of time for a good chat with his troubleshooters in the Union. But for a moment, the Union leadership does not feel threatened. Good morning, Clive. Is this part of the conference routine? A uh, clean mind in a healthy body helps all the time. Do you, do you enjoy conferences, Clive? Uh, well, they're fascinating and they're stimulating. I prefer conferences, of course, that come to firm decisions. But isn't the platform, in fact, trying to avoid a firm decision on the Tony Benn, uh, Dennis Healy issue? Our first approach was that we felt there should not be an election because the country now is in a, the kind of situation it was when Hitler invaded Norway. Only this time, of course, the, the enemy's inside. We would rather have not had a contested election this year. But if there is going to be a contested election, we think we ought to consult all our members. There will be a move, I understand, however, to draft Tony Benn. Do you think that'll meet with success or have a lot of support? Oh, I never go in for prophecy about uh, uh, conference decisions. The right thing, I believe, however, now is to ask everyone because we don't know how many candidates there are going to be. And that's a matter of great importance. Benn's allies tell him that they will be pushing a motion supporting him for the deputy leadership. But the platform will be hard to beat. Their proposal to refer the issue back to the branches has the virtue of sounding reasonable and democratic. But before the big debate, there is yet another fringe meeting. The purpose of, uh, the purpose of this meeting is to try to focus attention on some of the really big political decisions that have got to be taken by every trade union in Britain, uh, certainly will be taken by the ASTMS conference, will be taken at the TUC conference. It is not all heavy stuff. Tony Benn knows how to make an audience laugh. The House of Lords is, of course, an absolute obstacle to the implementation of all these policies. I got into terrible trouble here in Blackpool last October for suggesting we've made a thousand peers. I can never understand why there was such trouble. Uh, Harold Wilson made 250 of them to keep the place <laughs> going. And, uh, those of them that are already on parole are not all necessarily, uh, they're not all necessarily in favour of party policy. His energy seems boundless. What keeps him going? Three million unemployed and uh, our welfare services are being destroyed and people's lives are being ruined and they're being threatened by nuclear war. That's what keeps people going. It's not just me. I mean, the, this is a really big crisis for the British people. But just how would the left go about defeating the platform and swinging the conference behind Ben? In hotels like this all over Blackpool, groups of delegates gathered in the evening to discuss tactics for the big debate. The left are not alone in this. The right and even the centre rehearse their tactics. It is the very stuff of union conferences. It's the emergency motion one, which is the NEC's changed emergency motion on the Labour Party leadership. Which we consider is going to be a delaying tactic. Why? Well, they're just delaying. It means that they're not going to be mandated at all when the time it comes to ADC. Sure. And then the NEC are going to be able to come in and just throw their weight in and... Manoeuvre the delegation. Yeah. 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 And we must remind everyone that the NEC's first thoughts were to support Healy and uh, not have a proper election. Yeah. And that, right. what we've got to do is make sure they're mandated tomorrow. That's right. I, I'd go along with it. And I think we've got one big plus for us, and that's that uh, presumably we're all at the Tony Bay meeting. And the response there was absolutely fantastic. I mean, it must have been one of the... I, I imagine it will be by far and away the largest meeting. We've certainly got the groundswell in support for Tony Benn, and now we've got to mobilise that into ensuring that our... And how would the left go about getting their views across to conference? Well, anyhow, I mean, this is, this is fine, but, I mean, somebody's actually going to have to get up and uh, make these points. I mean, are we going to have everybody trying to get up there? Because, I mean, he's going to be picking people and he's going to, he knows where certain people are sitting. Mm. So, I mean, everybody, it seems to me, should be trying to get in there and make these points, and we shouldn't yes. leave it to somebody else, mm. because it's very difficult. He can just go around the hall like this, can't he? I, um, how if he knows you? you? The next day, the debate started with uproar. Now, please, let's be orderly. I'm telling you there were not two-thirds, and I'm sure we can all see it from here. There is nobody coming to that Rostrum, unless the conference now agrees. Do you want another point of order when you're dis... All right, come on. Well, Seeley, Chairman of Race Relations Branch. Democracy is always worthwhile spending time over, Chairman. It seems...
It seems to me, Chairman, the point of order is this. The General Secretary looking around the room says the hands indicate to him and in his opinion it was not a two-thirds majority. There are a number of us who thinks different. We have a right to ask for tellers. We ask for tellers and I do move that we have tellers on that issue. Now please, I hope that we are going to have an orderly discussion of important affairs. No. The left were as good as their word of the night before. They streamed to the rostrum to raise points of order about how the debate should be conducted. The executive won the procedural argument. It was all they would win that morning, despite a plea for unity from Clive Jenkins. There is going to be a contest. And uh, there are some people who are sharpening this argument too much. And in this conference today, the argument has been sharpened too much. You can hear the knives on the grindstones. It's so important for us to be unified, not only in this union, but in the party as well. We've now got to take a card vote on emergency motion number two. But even as the delegates voted on the pro-Ben motion, it was clear that far from being unified, the union was as deeply split as the rest of the Labour movement. The votes were collected and then the delegates broke for lunch. For the platform, it was nail-biting time. Emergency motion two. Four, 14,684, against 14,034, so I declare emergency motion to carry. A defeat for the platform, a narrow victory for the Benites, the bandwagon is rolling. All along, Dennis Healy has shown he has had no illusions about his rival's chances. Do you think Mr Ben can be stopped? Oh, yes. Easily? Not easily. I think that there's, a, you know, a genuine contest here under rules which, as you know, I think most members of Parliament would like to change, but I think we can win it. Were you shocked, hurt, when Mr Ben said he was going to stand? Oh, no, I expected he would. I think he's been absolutely consistent. And, and he... I think if he loses this year, he'll stand again next year and the year after. Until he eventually wins? No, no, until we change the rules, because people really will get fed up of it. I do think people feel the important job is to fight the Tories and not keep fighting for personal position in the party. The last to join the Leadership Express was John Silken, who announced last weekend that he too was a candidate. He is thought to be Michael Foote's favourite for the job, a man of the left, advancing behind the banner of party unity. His biggest hope is that he can get the backing of the Transport and General Workers Union with the biggest vote among the unions. His campaign has yet to move off, but is he a Trojan horse for the right? So I was a phantom when I stood for the leadership. I'm going to f go into this contest in order to try to win. That was what I always determined to do. That's what I'm going to do now. Can you tell us, I mean, you're opposed uh, to the common market, you're against uh, nuclear weapons, uh, you're in favour of a spread of uh, public ownership. Where do you differ from Tony Benn? Well, I don't know what Tony Benn's views on everything are. They, I think he catches up with, pub, with the policy of the party just as everybody else does. But the fact is this, there is no Tony Benn policy, there is no John Silkin policy, there's the policy of the Labour Party. And I don't believe you can get people to work together if you keep punching your views, whether you're left or right, and saying this is the only way and this is how it's got to be. But it was Tony Benn's head-on style that won another victory at this week's Labour executive over reselection of MPs. Beaton, Michael Foote and Dennis Healy were left wondering, perhaps, who was really in charge. Certainly Frank Chappell, way out on Labour's right wing, believes that Benn will be a hard man to stop. Well, I, I mean, Ben must always have a good chance. Um, I think the key in the matter is going to be the Transport and General Workers Union vote because Ben will clearly have a fairly sizable support from the constituencies. And um, I think the determining factor here will be what the Transport and General Workers Union does. And if and they go I, for Ben, do you think that Ben will be in? I think Ben has then uh, a, a, a better than equal chance. John Silken too relies on the transport workers in the first ballot. But what then? If he fails to make it to the playoff, their votes will be up for grabs. And Tony Benn knows that he can rely on the majority of the constituencies. To paraphrase the Duke of Wellington, it could be a damned close run thing. It will certainly be a long, long summer for Labour. Party unity is still a long way off.